Hi, I'm Hannes. Hello, I'm Dominic. And today we have the paper Learning Parametrized Graph Shift Operators. And if you want to join these learning reading group sessions yourself, you find all of the information in the description. Hi, from me, I'm, I'm George, and uh, I'm a final year PhD student uh, in data science and mining group in uh, the Leaks Laboratory of uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And, uh, I'm Johannes Lutz, I am a postdoctoral researcher in the same group. And today we want to present work to you that we did under the supervision of Michalis Vazerianis. As Hannes mentioned, our title is Learning Parameterized Graph Shift Operators. From my previous experience in this group, uh, you guys hardly need encouragement to ask questions, but we want to do it anyways. Please ask away. Uh, as soon as you have a comment or a question, uh, we'd be happy to discuss our work with you. That's the purpose uh, why we came. So please, yep. uh, please ask. Mm -hmm. We'd like to begin uh, discussing this work by recalling uh, several ways in which graphs can be represented. I, I think for most of you, this most of you will be well aware of this, but it's useful context for our work. Mm -hmm. So. As you know, graphs can be represented using one of several matrices. The most popular of these matrices is the adjacency matrix. For unweighted graphs, the adjacency matrix contains entries which are either zero or one. Uh, specifically, the IJF entry of the adjacency matrix equals to one if and only if uh, node VI and node VJ are connected by an edge in the graph. So in the bottom left here, we have a five cycle and its corresponding adjacency matrix on its right hand side. From the adjacency matrix, we can calculate the degree matrix by taking row sums of the adjacency matrix, which gives rise to the unnormalized graph Laplacian, which is calculated as the difference of the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. <coughs> um, from the unnormalized Laplacian, we can calculate several normalized Laplacians uh, by either symmetrically or left normalizing uh, the Laplacian matrix by the degree matrix. Now, all four of these matrices are equally valid ways to represent graphs. Uh, they uniquely identify the graph structure they correspond to. But there are more ways in which we could represent graphs, uh, specifically by a family of matrices known as the graph shift operators. These are matrices which are defined to contain a zero in the IJ entry if an edge is absent in the graph. Note uh, that the existence of an edge doesn't necessarily imply the entry of an, a non-zero entry in the graph shift operator. Uh, as a result, the, a graph shift operator does not uniquely identify a graph structure there's no bijective mapping between graph shift operators and their graphs uh, in general. This property is untrue for the above four matrices. So the adjacency and Laplacian matrices are instances of a graph shift operator uh, with the additional property that they uniquely identify graphs. That is not strictly required for a graph shift operator matrix. So, uh, the important message here is graph shift operators are matrices that represent graphs. Uh, they could even be understood to, to be a, a definition of how information is propagated over the graph so because they can contain edge weights. Uh, graph shift operators play a prominent role in uh, representation learning. Here we choose to illustrate this using two examples. Uh, the first of which is the spectral clustering algorithm. And the spectral clustering algorithm, uh, we have to choose on the basis of which graph shift operator we perform the analysis. Uh, on screen here, we have the famous uh, Zachary's Karate Club uh, network. And we see that the result of spectral clustering on the basis of different graph shift operators uh, is different. So the choice of graph shift operator in representation learning is uh, impactful in some cases. I suppose what you guys would be more interested in is uh, graph neural networks. Also in graph neural networks, uh, the choice of graph shift operator is prominently made. For example, in the graph convolutional network, uh, the message passing scheme chosen can be encoded 
by the symmetrically normalized adjacency matrix here. In the work of Xu et al. in 2019, the sum-based aggregator for GNNs is discussed. Uh, the sum-based aggregator can be seen as uh, choosing the adjacency matrix in the model equation. The adjacency matrix corresponds uh, to a summing over neighborhoods. Wait, can we maybe go uh, just back one slide to, uh, um, sure. yeah, to make sure that we, we know what a graph shift operator is. So a matrix S is called a graph shift operator if it satisfies that um, whenever, uh, but yeah, whenever the source is not equal to the node, uh, to, the, to the destination, so I is not equal to J, then uh, SIJ is zero. What um, so we only have diagonal elements? Uh, no, that's that's uh, not quite right. Um, so a graph shift operator is an n by n matrix. If our graph contains n nodes, then uh, it's a square matrix of dimension n, and we have the additional requirement on this matrix that. Uh, it contains a zero entry uh, whenever an edge is absent in the graph. But this uh, requirement only applies to off-diagonal entries. So yeah. if, okay. if we look at this example here, we can see that all of these matrices satisfy uh, this property because, um, for example, we don't, uh, we have a zero entry uh, in position one, three. Yeah. So and if we number these uh, one, two, three, we see that uh, one and three are unconnected. And uh, this pattern of zero uh, applies to all three of the matrices here. So these satisfy this graph shift operator requirement. Yeah, so uh, we just have a um, matrix where everything is zero if there is not an edge. Correct, e exactly right. And there's no requirement on the diagonal. So we can leave the diagonal at zero as we do for the adjacency matrix, or we could fill it uh, with degrees as we do for the unnormalized Laplacian or with uh, constant entries one as we do for the no normalized Laplacians. Uh, in the general definition of graph shift operators, um, we can do anything we like with the diagonal. And yeah. in fact, we can also do anything we like with uh, entries for which edges are present. We can also choose to set this to zero, which I don't think is great because, uh, well, it gives us the ability to ignore edges, but it uh, loses some uh, expressivity in that uh, it's due to this reason that uh, graph shift operators don't uniquely identify graphs anymore. Yeah. Is this clear? Yeah. So for example, what you just, just said is, an identity matrix would also be um, a graph shift operator, but probably not so useful because yeah, we if we have edges somewhere, we're allowed to put zeros there, but probably we want to put something else there. Okay, and then uh, the basically an identity matrix would correspond to a uh, to an, a fully disconnected graph, like a set of elements. We don't have any information about the. Uh, relations between the between the elements. Yeah, well, but we we don't want to propagate information along the edges. Yeah. If we say we want to work with a signal model where uh, across edges we don't exchange information, then we can choose. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Of course, the of course, <laughs> if we have the usual adjacency matrix as the graph shift operator, then uh, the identity matrix will just be like a set but we can also have a six cycle or, or a five cycle right and have the identity matrix as a graph shift operator it just tells us nothing and it's useless but yeah but now if you go two slides ahead there you have these different uh karate graphs and you're saying yeah depending on what graph shift operator we choose we end up with different clusterings, for example, if we do spectral cl spectral clustering based on that graph shift operator. Which is, is right? to some degree a bit shocking, right? Because the rest of the algorithm, everything else stays the same. We only choose to represent our data differently. And I, I think uh, it's worrying that this matters, right? <laughs> okay. 
I don't know. I mean, if we now choose the identity matrix as our graph shift operator, then yeah. It doesn't okay. matter. You're right. But yeah, yeah no. these are all uh, graph shift operators that completely identify our topology. So it's not the same as the identity matrix. And just a minor comment, this, uh, this exact figure also gives a, a partial answer to the question that I see in the chat if, uh, uh, of an example that uh, the graph shift representation could be important, where here we can see that uh, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, graph that can be represented by three different uh, graph shift operators uh, can, uh, can yield different uh, uh, prediction results. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot for your questions. We'll, we'll continue if, yeah. if there are no further ones, but uh, please keep asking. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> I didn't hear. Um, hi, John. So I have a question. Yeah, thanks. Please yeah. ask. So what is the interpretation of the different weight values for the edges which are connected, like in this graph shift operator? Um, it can be context dependent, right? Like if we, if we enter a non-zero entry in such a graph shift operator, we are essentially weighting edges. Uh, so it, this could come with the data. We could have uh, edges which are differently strong. Like for example, if edges represent uh, chemical bonds, these bonds can be of different strengths and then we can enter this weight in the graph shift operator. So it could have a physical interpretation or uh, alternatively we could enter attention weights into edges as we do in the graph attention network, uh, where this is a, an information which we learn from the data and we learn a, a relevance of a given edge to the representation of a node. So uh, to, to, to summarize this, we can enter additional information in these weights. Okay, it makes sense, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so to summarize what's been said so far, graph shift operators are matrices that represent graphs. Uh, in representation learning on graphs, uh, we have to choose uh, which we use, and this choice can be impactful on our results. Uh, now, as far as we're aware, not so much has been said about this choice and this open question of how we should be representing graphs as matrices. Uh, but some things have. Uh, so, for example, Steve Butter and Pan Chung wrote in 2017 specifically about this choice of graph shift operator. Uh, no one matrix is best because each matrix has its own limitation and that there is some property which the matrix cannot always determine. And also in the graph signal processing literature, this problem has been discussed. Uh, the consensus that we extracted was that uh, the graph shift operator choice. Uh, is said to involve different trade-offs to lead to different signal models. And therefore the conclusion which they drew was that one should use whichever graph shift operator works best in a particular analysis and learning task. It's against this backdrop that we formulate uh, the research questions which we study in today's talk. Um, we firstly ask whether there's a single optimal representation to encode graph structures or whether optimal representation is task and data dependent. And more practically, uh, we ask whether we're able to learn such an optimal representation for graphs in a numerically stable and computationally efficient way. Are there any questions about this introduction and motivation of our work? Yeah. So can you name an other example, like the adjacency matrix normalized Laplacian and Laplacian are things I know, I guess, but what are other graph shift operators? There's, for example, the signless Laplacian is again a Laplacian, but here we add the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. Oh, okay. There's the diffusion operators, which uh, your group, uh, Johannes Klipera and, and Gunnemann, they, they wrote a nice paper called Diffusion Improves Graph Learning. The diffusion matrix could be seen as a graph shift operator. There's uh, the non-backtracking operator. 
Um, there's a variety of more niche operators. They're called Z-Laplacian and T-Laplacian, which occur in one or two papers each. Um, yeah. Okay. Really, the most popular we've named at the start, but there's a long list of things which have been thought of and uh, yeah, it's open, which which we should be using. Good question. Thank you. Shall we move? Yeah. On? yeah. So, uh, thank you, Hannes, for uh, for putting ahead the motivation. So, to address these two research questions that uh, Johannes uh, uh, have been po uh, have posed, uh, we actually. Uh, introduce uh, a new a new family of graph six operators, basically a parametric family of graph six operators. That is that is basically graph six operators that can adapt throughout training, that can change their values uh, as the model is getting trained. And for this, we actually define what we call the parameterized graph six operator, that uh, is denoted by gamma of a comma s, and it's a function of the adjacency matrix. In a parameter set S, and it can be computed as it, as is uh, shown in equation two, which is a summation of three terms, and these uh, three terms uh, consist of uh, three multiplicative parameters M1, M2, and M3, three exponential parameters E1, E2, and E3, and an additive parameter alpha, which basically corresponds to the weight that we um, assign to the self connections. Uh, as we can see, the alpha is uh, actually multiplied with the identity matrix that is then uh, uh, added to the adjacency matrix. Uh, so we have a parameter set S of multiplicative, exponential, and an additive parameter. And this uh, uh, is employed in our uh, parameterized operator. So uh, these parameters can take either a vector form or they can obtain just scalar values. So basically we can have just scalar variables for these uh, parameters or vector forms, depending on how much complex we want this information from the graph shift operator to be. In our experiments, what we will show next, uh, we used the, the scalar uh, value um, aspect uh, because we wanted to be also very um, uh, efficient from the model design uh, aspect but also we could see that we could have an enhanced model performance. So uh, um, the, the key idea behind uh, having these uh, um, um, parameterized graph shift operator or PGSO as we call it, is basically the idea that uh, uh, the equation two can encapsulate and can express a large range of different graph shift operators that have been used before in graph representation learning tasks, as Johannes uh, mentioned. Uh, for example, we have the adjacency matrix, the Laplacian, uh, the normalized versions of the Laplacians, but also we have the uh, normalized adjacency matrix of uh, the graph convolutional network, as uh, Johannes uh, described before. And also we have the mean aggregation operator that has been used in uh, variants of GNNs, uh, such as uh, graph sage. Um, and uh, we can see that. Uh, these operators can be expressed and they can be seen as instances of the same uh, uh, PGSO by simply uh, setting the values of the um, uh, parameters inside the parameter set of the PGSO. So yeah, this is the basic idea to, to try to find a, a, an operator that can wrap up all of the uh, uh, well-examined operators uh, that have been used before. So after defining the PGSO, we actually show how we are going to incorporate it into the model. So we first assume that we have a GNN model that uh, it is generic enough uh, by using uh, just a non-parametric uh, uh, function phi of the adjacency matrix and an attribute matrix X. X is uh, basically um, shown in we have uh, an attributed graph. And uh, this, model F, uh, this model M has also uh, K aggregation layers. So uh, the idea uh, behind uh, building our uh, framework is very simple and pretty straightforward. Basically, we replace the non-parametric function of the adjacency matrix to our new parametric uh, uh, graph shift operator. And we name these models as GNN PGSO and GNN multi PGSO. The difference is that in the PGSO uh, formulation, we employ a single operator, a single, uh, a single uh, graph shift operator throughout the aggregation layers. So the weight 
uh, of the of the operator are shared uh, throughout uh, the aggregation. Uh, while in the multi-PGSO scenario, we have different parameter sets for each one of the aggregation layers. So we, if we have K aggregation layers, we have K different uh, PGSOs. So uh, in simple words, we just replace uh, this uh, graph the, the original graph shift operator with uh, the PGSO. Uh, in convolution-based uh, GNNs, like the GCN or the SGC or other models, uh, this replacement is straightforward. It, it, it can be performed explicitly uh, because the graph convolution is expressed um, uh, as, a, as a matrix multiplication. So basically we take the original matrix and we replace it with uh, uh, the gamma. Uh, but, uh, while in message passing uh, schemes, uh, in message passing GNNs, this, this replacement is performed implicitly because uh, the, the, the graph convolution is already expressed as a neighborhood aggregation step. And so now we're going to show uh, two examples of how we can utilize uh, exactly this uh, BGSO into GNN models. Uh, the first sorry, is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah. there's a three raised hand in the chat. Oh. Um, so I'll first start with uh, my question. Yeah. Um, uh, in the previous slide, you said that you can also have the parameters M, A, um, E as vectors. What, yeah, exactly. what does it mean to have them as vector? So basically, uh, if we have a uh, the, if we have a vector form in M1, M2, and M3, and you know all of the on all of the cases, basically we have different weights for each one of the nodes. Right now, what we have is basically a scalar value for each one um, uh, for, for each parameter. So, in a sense, we give just uh, an importance weight uh, to each one of the terms. We we, we say to this to this term that okay. Uh, uh, the, the the degree matrix is going to be uh, multiplied by a, a scalar value, for example, uh, zero point three. But if we would like to have different um, um, different values for each of the rows of the degree matrix, then we could have a, a vector form of the uh, of this uh, of this parameter m one. Right now, and what we will show in in the experiments are using just scalar values. So this alpha, this additive parameter, is going to be the same for all of the nodes. And the same applies for the exponential parameters, and the same applies for the mul multiplicative parameters. Yeah. One, yeah. one yeah. other example is, for example, if we replace the parameter a by a vector, then we can uh, add self loops to the nodes of different degree. So, yeah. so at the moment with scalar parameters, we're operating at a graph scale. We're learning parameters for an entire graph, and if we use vector parameters, then we're operating on a node scale. And we're able to learn parameters per node, but then our parameter set scales with the number of nodes, and so we were a bit hesitant to to submit this. <laughs> but it, it it seems it seems to also be a good idea. I think both both could be done. Sure. Okay, thank you, um, Julien. You can go next with your question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, well, so my question maybe you're gonna talk about this, but uh, my question was just to ask if you could comment on the relationship between, uh, and you mentioned this earlier, but the relationship between this architecture and uh, something like uh, GAT. So I guess GAT can be seen as a special case for this as well. And um, yeah, I'm wondering if in practice, the kinds of um, shift operators that you get from GAT and from this, uh, this more general form tend to uh, resemble each other or not. Yeah, that's a nice question, actually. What we will show also in, in, in the experiment is that for different, for different models and for different scenarios, uh, the, the behavior of this PHO is, uh, is also different. So it's going to, we're going, we will show that uh, we have uh, a flexible behavior of the, of the, of the parameters of the, of, the, of, the, of the operator, depending on the, on the model that is applied and the task that is uh, asked uh, to be solved. Yeah, but we, it's a nice question. We haven't done this comparison specifically of uh, the attention weights in the GATS to the know. parameters we learn. It, it might be might be interesting to take a look at. But we because do, it, we do yeah. have further results. Like we yeah. will discuss the GAT and we see that, uh, for example, the performance of the GAT is slightly improved if we use the uh, parameterized graph shift operator instead of the standard GAT operator. Oh, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, I, I guess uh, 
I guess one of the major differences here is that uh, this, um, param this shift operator um, is a shift operator that operates on the, the global graph and the structure okay. of the graph, whether GAT operates on the node features. Um, so uh, in some sense, like uh, GAT cannot uh, differentiate. Um, um, well, yeah, if, if all the nodes have the same feature set, um, it's uh, very difficult for GAT to differentiate between them. And this could happen if you have, for example, um, an, a social network where everyone is the same, uh, almost the same, or a molecule where you only have carbons. Whether here you have an operator that uh, directly look at the structure of the graph instead of the features of the graph. But, but GAT can also be seen as a parameterized shift operator, right, in some sense. So. It's an instance of a graph shift operator, but I don't think it immediately falls into the parameters that we learn because GAT learns the edgewise parameters. Or GAT I know, it would be a special case. Yeah, it would be a special case, right, of this? Well, in some we, sense. we only have seven parameters for the entire graph, seven scalar right. parameters in this formulation that we show here. And, and, and just a small comment, uh, uh, if we see the, the parameters as, a, as an input of the function here, then we don't have a linear uh, um, result that we could have from the attention coefficients. Uh, I guess this is another difference. But yeah, I think that this is a very nice uh, remark. I didn't, I didn't realize it in the beginning. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it should be helpful to, to find a comparison between the, uh, if we can see that as a, as a PGSO itself. Okay, thanks. thanks. Thank you for your yeah, question. Good thought. Uh, I have Any other question? question. So uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on on this PGSO definition, because from what I understand, um, the, the, the motivation is that you get um, a general form that has a few parameters that can also recover uh, many of the, like the, the popular operators in, in graph neural networks, but do you have um, another interpretation for, for this definition of PGSO that, uh, I don't know, another, another point of view on, on this definition, mm -hmm. because just looking at it uh, without having in mind the, the operators, it, it like, it, it's, it's hard to make sense of it for me. I agree from the, from the, from the operator operator design point of view, yeah, actually what we try to do is basically to group them together. But the objective of this is uh, to try to see if we can have interpretable results out of this operator. So what happens uh, throughout training uh, with the parameters, what the model is trying to say uh, to tell us about the graph structure itself. So I, I agree that the design of the operator itself uh, is uh, consequential out of the, out of the uh, coverage of uh, already known operators, but our objective was not just to have an operator and say that, uh, okay, now we are better having this one, this one but we, we, we wanted to find a way uh, to visualize um, what uh, uh, such an operator um, is uh, looking for uh, through a propagation scheme in a, in a, in a, uh, in a prediction task. And also, maybe something relevant to say in this context is that for a while we looked at um, we looked at how we could define this operator as spanning a space of affine matrix transform transforms. So if we look at uh, the adjacency matrix, uh, then we can say it, an affine transform of this matrix might be M two A plus I M one identity. But uh, we didn't, uh, we weren't able to get something really pretty there because of the degree matrix and its exponents. I mean, the degree matrix again is a transformation of the adjacency in the sense that we take row sums. Uh, but I don't know, it would be really nice if someone who's good at geometry <laughs> uh, defines a space of matrices and uh, defines a parameterized form which covers this space perfectly, a polynomial form of the adjacency matrix, but uh, ours is, uh, we couldn't motivate it in this way. Ours is uh, just a, a form which spans the commonly used ones. 
like like George said, we we didn't get such a geometric interpretation. We explicitly aimed to not take powers of the adjacency matrix because this is expensive, and we wanted to have an operator which has a receptive field of the immediate neighborhood of nodes. Uh, so we weren't looking to expand the receptive field. This this has been done by by people looking at the fusion operators, um, but it's again a really good question which we didn't manage to fully investigate to the end yeah. it, it, okay it, thank and, you yeah thanks we'll look out for raised hands from now yeah. on. i didn't realize we, yeah. we should be doing this but really please interrupt as well if we missed some shall i proceed yeah. okay so yes in uh, in the graph convolution uh, network, where the propagation rule is basically the matrix multiplication of a uh, normalized adjacency matrix along with the um, node representation matrix H and the weight matrix W, and all of them are followed by a nonlinear fraction, uh, the, the replacement is, is performed explicitly by just removing the normalized adjacency with a, um, um, a PGSO and the uh, multi PGSO. Uh, scenario respectively, as you can see in, the, in these two equations. Uh, while in the uh, message passing um, um, scenario, like a graph isomorphism network, where the propagation rule uh, basically is expressed through a summation over the uh, uh, node neighbors, um, then the incorporation of the, of the PGSO um, can be seen uh, as, again, uh, um, a summation over the node representations uh, but instead, here we have also uh, the weights that uh, correspond to the node, to the central node itself, as the, as the blue one, and the edge weights that uh, connect the node with the direct neighbors. And uh, these are also um, uh, defined through the parameter, uh, parameters from the parameter set of the PGSO. And this is two examples of how we utilize the uh, um, PGSO into the GNN models. And Johannes, you can, you can continue. I don't see any words. Okay. Another thing we did as part of this contribution is we performed a brief spectral analysis. Uh, firstly, we wanted to say a few words about why, why even bother with this, why worry about the spectrum of our parameterized graph shift operator. For, for, for us too, there's, there's many, many reasons because we really like this the subject, um, but we'll list two here. Uh, spectral graph theory is an, is an established field which goes back several decades, and uh, several results of significance have been achieved in this domain. Um, graphs can be seen in the graph domain, but they can also be seen in the spectral domain, and different information can be more easily or more, more difficultly extracted in these two domains. So it's often sensible to look at graphs in, in both domains, and uh, things can be learned in the spectral domain. Also, uh, graph neural networks are to some degree rooted in, in spectral theory, where uh, the message passing step can be seen as uh, performing a spectral filtering operation, and this has motivated a few early uh, um, GNN architectures, such as, for example, the ChatNet. So, uh, Spectral analysis is, is a topic of relevance in the, in, the, in the context of graph neural networks, and we have the two, two small results in this context. Uh, firstly, we were able to show that our parameterized graph shift operator has real eigenvalues and a set of real eigenvectors independent of the choice we make in the parameters S. This is a nice result because uh, the PGSO matrices are non-symmetric in general. Uh, at the same time, they're all similar to a symmetric matrix, and that, that is how we prove this result. Uh, secondly, we straightforwardly applied the gersh goren theorem uh, to obtain a lower and an upper bound on the eigenvalues. Uh, we see that this lower and upper bound is in terms of the parameters, of our parameterized graph shift operator and in terms of the node degrees. Mm -hmm. To visualize this bound uh, slightly better, we have some examples here. For example, if we choose the parameters 
which allow us to recover the adjacency matrix. So if we make the parameter choice such that our parameterized graph shift operator equals the adjacency matrix, uh, we see that uh, these lower and upper bounds resolve uh, to the minus the maximal degree and plus the maximal degree uh, well-known results. So this is a calming sign. Uh, this theorem seems to be working and then we recover known results but we're also able to observe results which we hadn't seen in the literature before. Uh, for example, for the GCN's message passing operator, uh, we can lower and upper bound the spectra uh, as here. And somewhat interestingly, we see that at least our bounds are only centered around zero in the limit uh, as the maximal degree tends to infinity. For finite graphs, these bounds are not uh, centered at exactly zero. Uh, we've observed these bounds in practice as well. Uh, so here we have results from a GCN trained on the task of node classification on the Cora graph. In plot A, we have the spectral bounds, which we just calculated. And surprisingly, we observed that throughout training, uh, these bounds remain centered at zero. And this is the center. This is how the center of this bound is parameterized. It depends on all our parameters and the node degree. Uh, yet our parameters that we learn uh, seem to be learned in a balance, which maintains the spectral, the center of the spectral support at zero. And we actually don't know what's going on here. Something is going on. We wish we knew. Uh, so. It's a nice thing to see, <laughs> which we don't fully understand. But what we do understand and what is nice is that the spectral bound is uh, slowly varying and uh, seemingly converging. And similarly, uh, we observe in this instance that the parameters are, are smoothly varying. Uh, they're changing from the initialization. So we are learning a more optimal graph representation uh, throughout training. And we do seem to be converging to optimal parameters fairly early. So this, to some degree of proof of concept, uh, we see that things can behave nicely in this context. We are able to learn uh, optimal graph representations and, and our spectral bounds allow us to monitor the support of the spectrum efficiently. Um, I'll, are there questions about this part of the presentation? Um, well, I guess a quick, quick question. Uh, I was I was wondering in terms of this being centered at zero, if um, that was dependent on like the initialization scheme of the parameters in some way, if that could have an effect or not. I wouldn't say that. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm probably could have a relationship, but as we will show in the in the next slide. Uh, because we, we made the sensitivity analysis over the different initializations, uh, the model was able to uh, bounce back and have a smooth behavior in different scenarios of initializations. So I, I, I really don't know what uh, we should expect there with, with respect to the, to the initializations, to be honest. Okay, but yeah, yeah neither do I. I was just uh, wondering. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Could be the case, like yeah. for example, for the Laplacian spectra, these are not centered. Uh, like yeah. for the adjacency, we have the results. The adjacency spectrum is always centered at zero because of Sylvester's law of inertia. And then for the Laplacian matrices, the unnormalized Laplacians are centered at mm -hmm. one. Uh, the normalized Laplacian is centered at the, I think, what is it, at the average degree or something like this. I'm not sure. Uh, but but again, yeah, maybe if we initialize that Laplacian, this changes. Um, the center for sure, but we're not sure about the symmetric uh, uh, position of the of the bounds, right? Yeah. Good question. So by by having uh, the 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 spectrum remain center at zero, but the we know that the Laplacian is not centered at zero, and the normalized Laplacian is not centered at zero. Also, it means that the uh, what you're learning is is something that is. Uh, much closer to an adjacency matrix than a Laplacian matrix, right? And this yeah. can make a lot of sense in this kind of graphs. Uh, if you if you look at the data right now, I think you're working on Cora. 
um, yes. because most of these graph data sets uh, rely on a smoothing behavior on a like you need to smooth the function of your neighbors whether for the laplacian you're looking for the the spike and the difference um, so in some sense laplacian is much more sensitive to the noise and for some signal, the noise can be very helpful, for example, edge detection in an image. But for some other signal, like uh, social networks, um, then uh, smoothing is more, a, a more important, um, is much more important than boundary detection. And especially uh, right now, the way that you learn the parameters is like either you, you cannot learn both the adjacency and the Laplacian, like you have to converge to one or the other. Um, and uh, be, because of that, it means like it will probably go towards something more similar to an HSNC matrix to avoid uh, having uh, like the high frequency signal and the noise um, like uh, detected. Um, but in some sense, one, uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to ask at a later time is like using different uh, PS, uh, PGSO at the same layer. So to allow the network to learn different ways of aggregating at a single layer. And that, that's something we did, for example, in our PNA paper. Like we say, there's not a single view that works well at a single layer. You need different views. And by doing that, then maybe you could have something that learns also like uh, something more similar to Laplacian and noise filtering. Yeah, that's good thought. Also something that we discussed in this context is that, like you say, for Cora, it's homophilic, right? So we want to smooth, and this is done by the adjacency matrix. So we might be able to observe as well that if we look at heterophilic graphs, uh, the differencing operation performed by the Laplacians becomes more attractive. But uh, this might be a cool experiment to do, to see whether for heterophilic graphs, we converge to a Laplacian representation and for, for homophilic graphs, we, we converge to an adjacency matrix. This is also aligned with our results that we're going to show in the CORA dataset, where for the different initializations, the Laplacians had the mirroring effect. True. Yeah, we will, we will, uh, we will talk about that in the experimental uh, section. In some sense, you will, uh, I think it will never converge uh, to something that's uh, very similar to Laplacian matrix. It might be like, um, perhaps having a small term related to the Laplacian, but, but in general, the low frequency signal is the most important in any kind of graph. Uh, in, and in any kind of signal processing, low frequency is almost always the most important. And uh, Laplacian being a high frequency filter, uh, it, it cannot converge to that unless you're having two different aggregators one converges to the low frequency and the other converges to the high frequency so that they can be used uh, simultaneously. Like that, that, that's uh, my opinion. Yeah, that might be right, yeah. Very nice, Mark, uh, thank, mm -hmm. thank you. I, actually, actually, another thing we could say here, I didn't uh, mention this, is that in this plot, we nicely observed that E2 and E3 are, are so close together that they are indistinguishable in this plot. So for example, we see for Cora, it seems to be advantageous to symmetrically normalize the adjacency matrix. This is a fairly strong signal. We had this in several of our experiments. The symmetric normalization seems to be advantageous uh, for, for a lot of data sets. Should be possible. So now we are going to uh, proceed with the empirical evaluation of the PGSO. We actually performed uh, um, uh, different uh, tasks, uh, either synthetic or, or, or real-world uh, um, uh, data set. Uh, uh, we performed tasks in either synthetic or real-world data set. Um, the, the first one, and uh, is also connected with what we were saying before, uh, has to do with what the PGSO can interpret from the graph structure. So uh, we asked ourselves what we can handle, what, what our operator can handle uh, from uh, uh, what, kind of, what kind of graph structures can our operator handle uh, with respect to the model training. So uh, the reason why this is important is because uh, as uh, Johannes uh, showed in the beginning, 
in the spectral clustering, different uh, operators gave different results. And we know that in different tasks, uh, there are different characteristics characteristics that we are uh, meeting uh, in, in graphs. For example, we can see either large and dense graphs or large and sparse graphs, or even small small and sparse graphs. For example, in molecular networks, uh, we can we can meet many times uh, graphs that are small and 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 sparse. So uh, we were asking ourselves how does uh, this operator PGSO uh, behave uh, when when applied to graphs with uh, varying sparsity levels. And this is important to us because, um, you know, firstly, uh, we can show that uh, uh, um, we can see if the, the PGSO uh, can can adapt to to, the, to a varying sparsity. But also, we would like uh, we could see if there is a single optimal representation, or we we, we can have different representations that uh, express uh, um, different uh, sparsity levels. So uh, for this evaluation. Um, uh, we based um, um, on stochastic block model generators. Basically, uh, we wanted to produce um, samples of graphs uh, with uh, varying sparsity. So uh, we actually produced uh, uh, 15 different uh, combinations of sparsities by uh, modifying the parameters of a stochastic block model, which are P and Q parameters. And uh, basically, in the stochastic block model, we have graphs that tend to create communities and these communities can um, sparsely connect to each other. So um, uh, we, we, we tweaked these parameters and we, we produced uh, 15 different uh, um, uh, sp uh, sparse, uh, sparsity levels, uh, but uh, uh, we, we intended to keep, uh, to keep the level of difficulty of the problem the same. And uh, by, by this, I mean that we wanted to be the communities as detectable as, detectable as it is in, in, in every scenario. So, we fixed what is called the detectability level. And detectability level is basically the ratio of the edges inside the block, inside a community, uh, uh, with respect to the, to the number of edges that occur between different blocks or, or uh, communities. And uh, according to the work of Vivedi et al. at 2020 of the benchmarking graph neural networks, we uh, performed a node classification task in such scenarios where each one of the communities um, had uh, a, a node that carried a message over the label of the of the of the of the community that it belongs, and this message was uh, 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 spread um, throughout the neighborhood. And the uh, and the main objective was to classify the the unlabeled nodes with respect to which uh, community they belong. So basically, it's a transformation of a node clustering problem to a node classification problem. And uh, um, as you can see in the bottom left, you, uh, we have the, the adjacency matrices of these um, of these um, um, uh, graphs in order to visualize this uh, um, decreasing uh, uh, sparsity. And uh, in order to visualize the evolution of the parameters of the PGSO, uh, we use the three-layer uh, uh, GCN PGSO model. Um, and uh, as we saw in the in the bottom uh, right uh, figure. Uh, Basically, uh, there are two things that are uh, quite interesting. Uh, as, as, the, as the graphs are getting sparser, most of the, um, uh, most of the parameters of the PGSO are, remain constant, while uh, the additive parameter uh, is having a constant increase. So that, that being said, we, 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 found, uh, we, we found a case where indeed the PGSO can decouple this information from the rest of the information by, by saying that the additive parameter could be the one parameter that uh, um, is clearly affected by this varying sparsity, and uh, um, this is also um, the, 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 this uh, observation also confirms uh, what has been previously uh, being um, uh, studied in the literature regarding the GSO regularization over sparse uh, graphs. The works from Dalamico and Kinn and Hohen. And so yes. With this kind of experiment, we basically saw two things. We saw that uh, the PGSO could indeed adapt to a scenario with varying sparsity over graphs. And we can clearly see that uh, for different sparsity levels of the graphs, uh, the, the, the learned parameters were different. So the, we, have, we, we should make an unsafe a claim that the, uh, the different, different uh, scenarios, different graph scenarios, uh, should correspond to different um, uh, GSOs and different graph representations. 
So, uh, uh, as you may have asked, uh, um, the PGSO contains parameters, and these parameters need to be initialized in order to have a model that is getting trained. And uh, we were we were curious about uh, the sensitivity of of the model uh, depending on the on the on the parameter initialization. So what we did is that we uh, initialized uh, the PGSO with five different initialization scenarios from known operators, and uh, we uh, trained the model with the same with the same um, hyperparameters in the same data set uh, with the same uh, setup uh, with uh, five different initializations. The first one was a, the standard GCN initialization. Uh, the second one was an adjacency one. Uh, we had two uh, variants, uh, two, two, two um, normalizing variants of the Laplacian, and the generate the um, uh, version of all zeros where all the parameters were, were set uh, uh, as a zeros in the beginning. And uh, what we can see, at least uh, um, in the three, uh, in the three uh, first uh, initializations, is that uh, the multiplicative parameters M1 and M3, and also the uh, exponential parameters, were monotonically uh, were having the trend of the monotonical increase until they converge to some point. While uh, the most interesting part is that the, the parameter M2 and the, the additive parameter A show the mirroring behavior when we see the, um, the instances of the, of, the, of the normalized Laplacians uh, with respect to the other three. And these may be aligned with the, our comments that we made before uh, about the um, tendency of the Laplacian matrix uh, to, to, to detect the difference instead of the uh, smoothing operation rather than the other uh, operators. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, and given the smooth behavior of the parameters, we actually, saw, we actually uh, have seen uh, in, in, this, in this specific setup that uh, um, the accuracy was not very sensitive to the initializations, but we can see that, especially for the Laplacian's case, uh, indeed, we have a, 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 a worse performance in the validation um, accuracy. And uh, I, 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 I want to, to mention here that this data set was Cora data set, the one that we, we tested at this uh, sensitivity analysis um, problem. And this may be aligned in, 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 indeed with uh, what we were talking about with, uh, uh, with respect to the smoothing uh, of the neighborhoods. So uh, finally, and and given these uh, analysis, we also wanted to show, to see uh, and to observe the uh, contribution of such an operator uh, in uh, real world data sets. Uh, basically, we, uh, we evaluated, uh, um, we, we, we tested the uh, different uh, tasks, specifically node classification and graph classification. The reason is why, uh, the reason why we, we wanted two, uh, two kind of tasks is firstly, because we would like to highlight the fact that uh, PGSO is a, um, could be a flexible tool uh, to be adapted to many different tasks and data sets. And also we would like to see uh, the, the different behavior of the operator um, um, with respect to the, to the node or the graph classification task. And for this uh, evaluation, we, we tested four different architectures, the graph convolutional network, the simplified graph convolution, the graph attention network, and the graph isomorphism network. And for each one of these models and each one of these data sets, we have three different variants. The standard one, the standard one, which was the one with uh, um, um, uh, the, the original graph shift operator, and the other the two instances, the PGSO and the multi PGSO. And uh, a general comment that we can make is that for all data sets and architectures that we uh, examine, uh, when we incorporated the PGSO and or the multi PGSO uh, uh, model, we could have an enhancement over the model performance. Sometimes this enhancement is not very uh, strong, and sometimes it, it, it is. Actually, we can make an unsafe claim that the impact of the PGSO is higher in graph classification tasks, but we are not really sure how we can explain that. Probably uh, an explanation over that is, uh, uh, firstly, that graphs um, uh, in graph classification tasks are usually uh, smaller, and that makes the impact of uh, the parameters of a PGSO probably larger, but we are not sure about on that. And, and secondly, uh, in graph classification tasks, the, the impact of the PGSO 
corresponds to the graph representation as a whole. So basically, we get a, a representation for the whole uh, graph, and this uh, could direct could uh, uh, direct to uh, uh, to a larger um, uh, uh, impact of the of, of the final task. Uh, in any case, uh, between uh, PGSO and multi PGSO, uh, we couldn't really find a, a winner in this situation. And sometimes uh, PGSO was better than multi PGSO. Sometimes it was uh, worse, even from the standard one. So we can't really claim which one is better. Uh, just from the matter of the efficiency, uh, uh, we could uh, we could say that PGSO is better because we have a, a smaller parameter set. But uh, uh, having said that uh, the parameters are uh, um, scalar values, we don't have such a, an efficiency difference. Uh, yeah. uh, any questions on the experiments or we yeah. Do you have questions on the experiments or are you happy with us to move on? Uh, you can move on. Oh, nice. Yeah, to conclude, uh, we propose the parameterized graph shift operator to you today to encode graph structures. We hope that uh, such an idea is useful in, in a variety of contexts in which graphs arises. But particularly in the context of graph neural networks, we see a potential in this idea. Uh, we think we hope that this can be further analyzed and, and uh, further architectures uh, can be built on this basis. Secondly, we've, we've demonstrated some initial theoretical results. Uh, specifically, we've proven that the parameterized graph shift operators always have real eigenvalues and a set of real eigenvectors. And uh, we've proven spectral bounds for them. And thirdly, we've demonstrated that the PGSO can be included in the GNN model and uh, improve performance across a set of architectures and real world data sets as well as tasks. And um, specifically in our synthetic study of stochastic block models, uh, we saw that uh, the parameters do adapt to graph properties and replicate known, uh, known behavior from the literature. As Hannes has kindly shared with you, you can access our uh, ICLR preprint on, on archive, and also our code is online now. Mm. We began by posing two research questions. We can now uh, attempt an answer. Our experimental results have shown that uh, there is no single optimal representation of graph structures. It does seem to be task and data dependent, at least within our parameter space. And uh, secondly, in the context of GNNs, we can learn these optimal representations uh, in a numerically stable and computationally efficient way. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to thank you very much for your questions so far, for your attention, and for uh, allowing us to speak today. Uh, thank you. Feel free to talk to us on Twitter. And uh, we welcome any questions you might have sure. now. Thank Perfect. You. Then thanks for the awesome presentation and the, the nice paper. But then, Viplo, let's have your question. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice uh, presentation. I, I really liked it. So one of the questions that I had was, did you look at comparing the, the graph shift operator or the, the parameters of your uh, uh, PGSO uh, when you were doing a different task on the same graph, for example, node classification and link prediction. So, mm. right, you, you said it's graph dependent and task dependent, but what if the graph is the same, but the task is changing? So do you see a lot of change or, or you haven't looked into that kind of a thing? Uh, we haven't looked uh, in an experimental level. We haven't looked at this uh, uh, setup. Like uh, I, I imagine you refer to data sets like Cora sites here or even uh, 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 that is from open graph benchmark where they, we can have either link prediction or a node classification. It's, it's, uh, it would be really cool to have, I mean, that we should, we, we have to, we have to, uh, to examine this case because right now, indeed, we, what we showed so far is basically different graph scenarios. And, uh, we are, we, we haven't seen the, uh, decoupled version of just seeing the, the, the task dependence, uh, instead of the graph dependence, uh, 
so yeah, yeah we haven't we haven't uh, looked up on this uh, on this uh, scenario, but but we should, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, thanks for your yeah, thank question. you. We, we briefly looked at graph auto encoders with Eom in this context, and but uh, this didn't seem to be the right way yeah. to observe our parameterized graph shift operator. Uh, it, yeah, it might be interesting to look at at how a different task. Yeah, because in link prediction, uh, when we are using graph auto encoders, then we should uh, take the decision uh, whether we need to. To, to incorporate the parameters of the PGSO also in the decoder huh. of the of the of the, of the graph autoencoder, and this makes the things a little bit more complex because then uh, the the loss function itself uh, should uh, also incorporate the information from the parameters of the PGSO. I, I think we had uh, a little bit discussion on that, but we we never really examined it. Huh. But thanks. Okay, yeah, I can see the loss function could create certain issues. Yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah. But there are GNNs like for a link prediction, and it should be something that we should uh, definitely look up. Uh, yeah, Dominic, Dominic yeah. please ask. Yeah, thank you a lot for the, the great talk. I, I really like the idea that uh, you built the paper upon. Um, and uh, yeah, there are also some of my previous work that agree with this concept that there is not a single aggregator that is uh, the best for all tasks and because they, they all have their advantage. Uh, and um, what you do here is like you, you learn uh, one aggregator that uh, you hope is really better for the, the given task. Um, but uh, one, one concern uh, that, that I have, and it's uh, very similar to the discussion that I said earlier, like uh, if you're looking to extract a low frequency signal, you're gonna have something similar to an adjacency matrix if you want high frequency signal, you're going to have something similar to a Laplacian. And it's very difficult, like with your current framework, to learn both, to have different features for both. And I, I will I will explain a bit like what I mean there and in what case it's important. Uh, suppose you have like uh, three molecules. Uh, yeah, sorry. You see, you see my drawing, right? So yeah. you have um, three molecules. Um, the here I'm going to put an X. See, so in node X uh, with two carbons next to to it, uh, you have another node X with two nitrogen next to it, and another node X with uh, one carbon and one oxygen here. Uh, so if we look at the periodic table, uh, we can see the uh, nitrogen is between carbon and oxygen, right? So um, Suppose you featureize the atoms with their respective properties from uh, um, from the periodic table, for example, mass, electronegativity, uh, valence, and this kind of things. Uh, you will see that in general, nitrogen is about the average of oxygen and carbon. So, what would happen if you have any kind of operator that is uh, any kind of degree times something? Uh, times the, any kind of degree power something times the adjacency. Um, well, you will not be able to distinguish uh, this one here from this one here because um, this will be either the sum or the average of the incoming nodes, and it will be uh, very, very similar because, as I said, nitrogen is kind of the average of the two. And this is kind of uh, looking at the low, uh, uh, the low frequency of the signal. Whether if you look at any kind of degree times the Laplacian, well, you will not be able to distinguish this one from this one uh, because then uh, you're looking at the difference. Um, well, uh, here, suppose you also have a, another carbon and another nitrogen. Well, now you're looking at the difference of uh, your neighbors and you're gonna see that like the difference is zero for both cases. So the distance will be zero here and zero here. Um, and this, uh, this is kind of the, the problem of uh, not being able to have many different aggregators at the same layer is the inability of looking at both high frequency and low frequency with, uh, with your current model simultaneously. So uh, the only thing I, I would like uh, to add here is uh, it would be very interesting to have your exactly the same work that you're doing, but uh, for the multi-PSO, 
all, all uh, the, the multi PGSO also have one that you learn multiple ones at each layer. Um, like for example, three or four uh, PGSO learned at each layer, then it could help uh, in my opinion. And then you concatenate the results of every aggregator. In my opinion, it could help also in improve the expressivity. Mm. And this is something very similar to the, the paper, uh, to, to one paper that I co-authored called the principal neighborhood aggregation. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, both theoretically and empirically having this kind of multiple aggregation uh, really helps. And I think with your framework, this could help even more than uh, the way that we did it in our work. Yeah, in PNA, you have these four different aggregators, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's related. It's nice. I think the suggestion is really yeah. nice. That it should be done. I mean, we need we would need some sort of data set where we're sure that uh, signals at different frequencies are definitely informative on the labels that we're trying to predict. But if, if you know this to be the case in the context of chemistry, that's perfect. We yeah. we should do this. Yeah. In the context of chemistry, I'm uh, very confident that it is sure. it is essential. Uh, for other data sets uh, like Cora, maybe you don't have any high frequency yeah. signal. But even then, um, like here, I just showed an example of low frequency versus high frequency. But just the example of uh, knowing the mean of your neighbors and knowing the sum of your neighbors simultaneously are two different, uh, are two different statistical information that are important. Um, and uh, yeah, if you train your network right now that maybe your degree matrix will be somewhere between the mean and the sum, uh, but not quite one or the other. So it's, uh, yeah, in my opinion, even like in low frequency signal data sets uh, like Cora, you should uh, be able to, to see some improvement, hopefully. Especially if we, if we incorporate the PGSO to the gut anyways, then we already have multiple heads in most scenarios. So then it's That's true. It's really a natural thing to do. It's a good idea. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed the paper. It's a uh, it's a very original way of uh, of looking at like uh, how we can leverage graph structure for aggregation. Thank you very much. It's kind of you. Yeah, I can't really add much to that besides that it's you know, a wonderful paper. And then, do we have any other questions for the audience? That's, that's a no. All right, then let's call the day after the last words from you, if you have some last words. Yeah, I suppose we want to thank both of you for, for allowing us to speak once more. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for uh, attending also our presentation and thank you for, uh, for having a chance to, to present it to you. Some exciting new research coming out of some ideas by Dominique, for example, and uh, I'm, I'm happy if this is another product of the reading group, and if you want to be a part of such products, then join the reading group yourself, you'll find all of the information in the description. <laughs>